is, and then they'll be. So let's go ahead and get down to it. Defining digital is really about figuring out what is digital strategy and what does it mean to run an integrated digital program? And that's really what we'll be focusing on today. Hello, I appreciate if you <laughs> muted. Yeah, and Dora, as host, depending on the settings, you, sh you, you should be able to go in theoretically and mute everyone, but it does depend on how the meeting's set up. Got it. Okay. Um, so first up, why does your digital presence matter? Why is this even something that you should consider? And there's a lot of different reasons for why this, why this is important and why this matters. Um, digital is a key touch point for people in pretty much every community. And digital can help you accomplish the goals of your organization. Um, it helps you to reach more people, engage them in a way that complements other efforts, and is often the first point of contact for folks who are trying to find a service or um, get involved in their in their community. Sometimes people will do a Google search to just find out what's out there. They may find you through um, social, you know, social media, looking to see how their friends are engaged, what their friends are following. So there's a lot of different reasons for why your digital presence is a really important aspect of being able to accomplish your mission. And having a strong integrated digital program is about a lot more than having a website or a social media account or any of the things that come to mind when you think first about a digital program. It's really about, um, sorry, I'm also looking at notes in here. It's really about how you approach your work and thinking about how digital is another tool for accomplishing what you need, what you want to accomplish. Like, let's say I used to work for an organization that was really focused on youth voter turnout and youth voter education. And one of the things that I did at that organization was work really closely with our organizing director and to help him see that using digital was a way of accomplishing his own organizing goals, which were obviously paramount to our organization. And so we started to use um, our social media platform as another way of accomplishing our education efforts, of reaching out to our constituency so that they knew what we were doing. We also got our, our digital organizer or our organizers involved in the digital side of things so that they were able to use social media as a tool themselves. And obviously that took some education, that took me um, more time on my, on my end, having, prepping them, help, helping them to be ready, you know, for that type of responsibility, but it ended up being an excellent tool in their toolbox for actualizing the goals that we had for our organizing program. So you really want to leverage digital in every aspect of your organization. Um, I really strongly believe in the power of an integrated program. And what that really means is thinking about how digital complements and ties into all of the work that you're doing. Um, so for example, like if you have an event and that's an IRL event, it can be hard to see other than putting a flyer on social media how social could be relevant, but it may be that you have folks who can't attend the event in person and want to glean insights of what's happening at, say, an educational event. You could have a live Twitter feed that encapsulates key moments in, in, in your event. So it's really about thinking of the ways that you can make digital work for you and apply to the type of work that you're doing on a day on a day to day basis and that really involves some planning right you can't just like shoehorn it in at the last minute it really requires a level of buy in and of talking to everyone in your organization and figuring out how it applies to them okay so what does it mean in practice i've already started to answer that question a little bit 
but we're going to really get into the details of that now. So this is the bulk of the presentation of this workshop is really about taking action, how you can actually create an integrated digital program. So you want to decide where your focus is and figure out what your goals are first and foremost. So this is a little bit about backing up and creating a plan before you start to take action. You want to make sure that you're aligned with your organization's purpose, figure out a goal, and then figure out how are you measuring impact? How are you demonstrating that it's worth the investment here? Because it is an investment. It's a time investment. Often it's a, and it's a dollar, dollar-based investment. And there's folks who need to understand the value, right? You might have a board that you need to answer to. You might have an executive director who you need to provide with reports. Um, so the first thing that I, I think is that you must do then is to figure out, okay, what is my organization accomplishing? Who are the key players? And what are, what is their, what is their goal? And then you decide what's your goal? How can, how can you focus on developing an integrated digital program that meets the needs of your organization and helps you accomplish a central, a central goal? And that goal needs to be ambitious, but it also needs to be achievable, right? Because if you set up a goal that's just like impossible to actually get to, it's discouraging. Um, and then it becomes hard to get folks to want to invest in digital in the future. Attaching metrics is where um, you help to prove your point. So you figure out whatever that goal is. Like, for example, if you are looking to increase the number of donors um, and in your in your donor engagement program at, at or and or you want to maintain, like, say, a 60 percent donor retention rate overall. You have to figure out how you're going to do that and also how you're going to measure that, right? You want to make sure that you you know like how many how many potential donors you have in your donor pool. Um, what is your current retention rate? Because if you can't benchmark against something, it's difficult to demonstrate that you're actually accomplishing any um, anything. So it's having the something that is defined and measurable is just super critical. So to go back to that um, donor example how you would do that from a digital standpoint that might that would ideally complement your overall donor strategy that was probably going to involve direct mail it might involve events there's all sorts of ways that you're probably that you're already engaging with donors in all likelihood uh, pardon me digital is the digital aspect of that would be to say okay i want to increase the number my number of donors but i have i have limited dollars to spend. Like I can't go out and try and acquire a bunch of new people on the, on my list. So you turn and you look at your current list and you say, okay, what's my cultivation strategy? Oh, let's see. I'm just sorry. I've just seen comments as what we cannot measure. We cannot manage. Yes, that is true. <laughs> and I'll get into that, um, even, even further as we, as we go along. Um, okay. But to get back to my current example, Look at your current list. Think about like how you can cultivate those people and turn them into donors. The people that you already have in your audience are so valuable because those people are already engaged with you on some level. Even if they haven't been engaged with you for a while, if they haven't unsubscribed, you still have a chance to re-engage those, those folks. So it might make a lot of sense then to run a re-engagement campaign via email and see if you can't get some of those people to open, open that email, click, click on, you know, click on a link, take some sort of action to that shows that they're further engaged. Then you want to think about your longer term strategy for re-engagement. So let's say that you ran a re-engagement campaign and it was really successful. If you don't have ways of continuing to engage those people with, let's say, compelling content through a newsletter or sharing things that are meaningful on, on, so, on social media that um, not only grab their interest, but answer important questions that they have or meet, meet a need that, that they have, Though that re-engagement campaign don't, won't hold a lot of value. So there's a lot of cultivation that has to take place, but 
you're cultivating folks who are already more likely to engage with you because they have already engaged in the past. Then you can start thinking about how do I actually start to ask those folks to donate? And that, and then you move into a different phase of, of your engagement strategy where you really want to move from like cultivation, which is always continual, but you want to move to that next phase of converting. You want those people to become donors and you need to figure out what is a reasonable goal. Sometimes you might not know if you've never kept data before on what your conversion rates are, you might be starting a little bit from a blank page and that's okay. A lot of organizations are in that, are in that space that happens. Um, that's when benchmarks like industry standard benchmarks from say M and R become really valuable because you can get a sense of where you should be performing as an organization, not only as a nonprofit, but um, organizations like M and R will break things down to your your particular sector, which really matters because every every type of nonprofit is really different. The size of your nonprofit really matters. Um, the type of work that you do matters. All of those things are going to have an impact on what you should be benchmarking against. All right. Moving on to the next um, next piece of this, and I've already alluded to this to some degree, is it's is you have to understand who your audience is. You might really already know your audience, and if you do, that's awesome. But sometimes your, who your audience is and what their needs are may surprise you. So you want to take some time to think about these questions. Who are you talking to? What needs do they have? What do you want your audience to actually do? Um, and there's a lot of different ways to solicit this information. Sometimes it's about looking at past data. Um, sometimes it's about conducting surveys or focus groups. You can go as deep as you want when it comes to audience analysis. You can develop full-scale personas where you have, you know, you like three or four types of, of, of audiences that are highly defined that in that process takes a lot of research, a lot of time, and usually a, a fair amount of money to, in, to invest in. Um, but you have to scale it for what's appropriate to you. And that goes back to doing something that's achievable, right? Just because it's not... Important to understand your audience doesn't mean that you should create a barrier for yourself that's so high that you can't really reach it. So how does being active in the digital world fit into your overall work and help you achieve your goals? There's a lot of reasons. Connecting with, it connects you with people in a different way. It provides another layer of contact for people that you wouldn't have otherwise. So if your primary touch points with folks is say direct service or through events or through direct mail, touching people digitally is another way of connecting with those people and helping to remind them of your value as an organization and of the work that you do and its value. And as I, as I talked earlier with that example of a youth voter organization that I worked for, think about how digital tactics fit into your overall program outreach rather than having it be just like another thing that people have to do. Maximize your time and drive impact. Now, this is like the dream, right? Everybody wants to maximize their time and drive impact, but what does that actually look like in practice? How do you actually do that? And there's a few key steps involved from, in my experience, first, you have to determine what your capacity is. How many people do you have on staff who can be engaged in this, in this work and at what level? Um, once you figured that out, Realize that you shouldn't try and be everywhere at once. Just because TikTok is big doesn't mean you should be on TikTok. Um, tic those types of social media platforms have a huge time investment component to them. And if you can't invest a lot of time in, and also like advertising dollars, sometimes it's not worth it to be present on those platforms. And that doesn't mean that you're not doing a good job. That means you're being smart with your time and thinking about what's going to drive the most impact for your organization. Facebook may seem like a tired platform, but if that's where your people are, then guess what? 
investing more time into being present on Facebook could be a valuable strategy for you. Um, email is, has been around for forever. And I think sometimes it, uh, people think oh, email's over. Email's not over. Email, I think was always going to be a relevant and really valuable tool to engage with folks. So really think about the different ways that you can touch people and think about where you can make the most impact within the constraints that you have around your time and leverage everybody from their seat figure out how they can engage with digital as a tool from their seat without it being something that they have to do in addition to their work. Think about how it can fold into their existing work. That, and that feeds right into the next thing, asking how can I use what already exists? Sometimes, and that when I say that, I mean people, but I also mean content because so much time for digital is in creating content. But a lot of lot of organizations actually already have a lot of valuable content um, that just can be repurposed, that can be used in different ways. You may already have some really great blog posts or articles. You may have um, some really great emails that you've written in the past or other types of communication that you have already put together. Maybe you have white papers or handouts or what have you. Use that. Use that. Um, and repurpose that content for the channels as appropriate. Let's say you have a report on affordable housing. That's like a 40 page long report. Well, if you send out a link to that PDF, people are not probably and are not going to be super engaged with that by email. But if you broke that up into a series of emails with short pieces that you pulled from it with like key insights, um, that were relevant to your audience, say you were sending to a list of folks who are doing um, affordable housing advocacy, they were, are going to be really interested in like specific punchy key parts of that report. So you pull those out and you create a whole email series around that, linking back to the report, sure, but you're figuring out how to repurpose content rather than write something completely new from scratch. And that maximizes your time and it drives impact. And the final point that I think is cannot really be overemphasized is that you should focus on quality over quantity. If you create a bunch of social media memes um, or graphics because you feel like that's what everybody else is doing, but the content isn't of high value, you haven't maximized your time and you're not driving the level of impact that you could. You will be your time is better spent thinking about. What is it that's going to really drive value to my audience? And how can I deliver on that with the resources that I have and the time that I have? I advanced too far into my slides. Okay, this is a question that I saw come up for folks already in the comments um, and questions that were sent to me in advance of this program. And that is how to make the case for investing in an integrated digital program. So how do I convince my boss? How do I convince um, the board? How do I convince the other people who are running programming at my organization? And I'm just going to re-emphasize some of the things that I've already said before. You have to show them how digital benefits their own work. Folks, as we all know, are often really strapped and very busy, and everybody is trying to do their best work and accomplish a whole bunch of different things. And, the, and sometimes it can feel like a lot to be like, oh, also, can you pull stories for me that I can use on social media, or I need you to, you know, write content for a newsletter. Um, but if you can help them to see how it folds into their ongoing work, you lower that, the, that resistance and you give them a way of helping to do their work even better um, and achieve and achieve those outcomes. And then that becomes part of how you convince your board that this is worth investing in. If you can demonstrate that you have made digital into a tool that helps you to accomplish your mission more effectively, that's pretty persuasive.
And then the final, I guess not final, but one of the other, uh, once you've thought about all of these other things, once you've figured out what your purpose is, once you've established what your goal is, once you have figured out what your audience needs and you have convinced enough folks that you can move forward with creating an integrated digital plan, it's time to create that plan. You want to make sure that you have to have your goals in that plan, how you're going to measure those goals, what are the key things that you're going to accomplish to bring those goals to fruition, and then you want to have a way of tracking that progress. And plans don't have to be 20 pages long and super complicated. Sometimes what you need is a high level plan that outlines things well enough so that you can just focus on executing. So my advice, especially if you're starting out trying to create an integrated digital program for the first time, is to keep it clear and focused, um, identify what's most important to accomplish, and then map it against the marketing funnel. And for folks who aren't aware of what the marketing funnel is, or think that that's just something that marketers who are selling products use, um, it's really it's really not. It has broad applicability um, across nonprofits and really anybody who is trying to get folks to do something. Um, at the end of the day, that's the purpose of the marketing funnel. And the marketing funnel has four main stages. You can break it up in a lot of different ways. Some, sometimes there's five, sometimes there's six stages, but the four main stages are um, cultivating awareness where you um, are trying to get people to know who you are. Um, and then the second stage is to um, get people to be interested and, to, and it's often called acquisition. And what that usually means is they, that you have people sign up to your list. So they're interested enough to say like, you know what, I wanna hear more about this organization. So I'm gonna like, I'm gonna follow them on Facebook. I'm gonna follow them on Instagram. I'm going to sign up um, to get their emails. Whatever that looks like for you with how your organization wants to prioritize how you engage. Let's see. I'm seeing a comment here, show the marketing funnel. I don't have an image of the marketing funnel in this presentation, but yes, you make a good point. And I can certainly provide that to Dora after the fact, like the basic marketing funnel. And yes, it should be customized for your needs. And, what, and that's what I really mean when I'm talking about mapping against the marketing funnel. And there's really two more stages after um, awareness and acquisition that are critical is cultivation. Uh, where you are consistently engaging with the people who have decided that they're interested in you. And then there's converting those people. Often that looks like um, donations, but it also can look like joining an event or taking some other kind of important action. And how you map against a marketing funnel is really by thinking about how the tasks that you need to accomplish and the goals and the goals that you have slot into those different into those different areas. And so you want you want it to work for you. So whatever um, acquisition means to you, that's what it should mean in the context of your own custom marketing funnel. When it comes to converting people, what is it that you want them to do? That is your con that's your conversion. And I will, I'm, I'm saving time back for questions. So I will be going through comments um, and answering more questions about, about this and other things shortly. So some of the key takeaways here are that you shouldn't devote time to something if you can't follow through with it. And that goes back to maximizing your time. Being smart with, being smart with your time and figuring out goals that are ambitious but achievable is really critical to long-term success because you're less likely to get burned out and you're more likely to continue having that buy-in within your organization. Second is that what's sustainable will pay off in the long run. Do something that you know you can keep going for a long time. So rather than spreading yourself too thin and trying to engage on every digital platform that exists, focus on the ones where you see the most engagement already where you can um, see that return on investment a little bit faster and that you know you have the bandwidth to continue. Stay focused on your goal. Once you've established your goals and your plan, 
stick to them. Don't switch them around. Um, obviously there's caveats there. Sometimes goals do shift some, so you should stay flexible, but in general, once you've established a goal and you've been careful and thoughtful about it, you want to stick with that goal or else it's going to be really hard to demonstrate what you've accomplished. Leverage the power of your whole team. Everybody should be involved to some degree in an integrated digital program. They just need to figure out how it fits into their own work from their own seat. And that goes from folks in programming or direct service um, to um, folks who are at the director level to people on the board. There's ways for them to all be engaged and invest in understanding your audience and how your digital efforts are performing. Because understanding your audience is really critical to actually engaging with those folks in the long term and getting them to do what it is that you want them to do. And if you can, and same with understanding how, how you're performing. If you don't know whether you're successful or not, you can't really know if you've accomplished any of your goals. So that's why measurement is so critical. And it doesn't have to be super complex, but identifying a couple key metrics that you can that you can benchmark against, that's that's going to really serve you in the long term. Like maybe it's around your click rate or engagement rate in your in for, for emails, you're at like a certain percentage level, let's say you're at 2% and you want to see that increase by one, by 1%. Great. That's a great goal to have. And that is something that you can track against. Just figure out what it is that's going to be important and then really stick with that. Right, and now I wanna open it up for Q&A. I have some questions that folks have asked already, um, but if anyone has a question now that you would like answer, you can drop it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask that question directly to me. Let's look through some of these questions. Hi, Elsa. I'm just going to go back to the, the chat. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Way back when the you started, um, Maynard Clark asked uh, a question about if you could discuss uh, the list of the digital ways in, in the chat. Um, he asked that if you could put a list. I'm sorry, a list of what? A list of the digital ways in the, the chat. I think you mentioned um, the what are the digital ways being the, more. I, I'm not sure I understand. Digital ways? The four main stages. Oh, the four main stages. I got you. Um, yeah, of course. Awareness, acquisition. And, and I'll also just point out that different, when you look at marketing funnels, they're not all going to have exactly the same terminology because they'll use words that are, you know, that are, that are very similar, but those are, these are pretty typical awareness, acquisition, um, cultivation, and conversion. And in terms of, yeah, thank you, Maynard. Yeah, those are all typical ways that you would want to engage with folks. And I'm also seeing a question, what's a good success rate for email marketing for nonprofits in terms of open rates, click rates, et cetera? And that's from jo Joanne. That's a great question. Um, there are, general guidelines around that, but I think it's really important to actually zero in on what's most relevant for your industry because the open, the, like 
for one, open rates are a little, getting a little bit trickier with, with Apple privacy. It's really clouding the meaning of, of open rates more and more, although it's still a somewhat useful metric. Your overall, like your click rates um, out of your, of your email, that it, as an engagement barometer is, is becoming like more and more important as is looking at things like unsubscribe rate. I'm going to drop a link to m &R benchmarks in here instead of giving specific numbers because you'll be able to look at their report and they break this down. Um, they typically break this down in more detail by type of nonprofit vertical because there are uh, there can be really significant differences. Um, and, and it's also important to note that there are differences depending on the type of email you're sending out. The click rate average on an email that is really about that is about, say, attending an event or um, reading an article is going to look really different than the click rate for a donation ask. A donation ask click rate is uh, that's good is less than one is going to be less than one percent. However, your overall like average click click rate that you're going to want to see on most of your emails if they're non donation related is going to be somewhere more in the ballpark of like two to three percent. Could be more, could be less. Um, I, when it comes to benchmarks, it's great to get a sense of the overall industry, but ultimately the most valuable benchmark is really your own. Um, so that's why collecting that data yourself is so important because you should really be benchmarking against against yourself and trying to improve like where you are and you over over time. So if you can look back at the last year and say like these types of email campaigns had this kind of open rate, had this kind of click rate, um, had this kind of unsubscribe rate, you'll get a much better, more nuanced sense of what's working for your audience because everybody's audience is unique. How do you get more people to sign up for your mailing list? And how do you get more people to even open your emails? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a question that every everyone has. Um, getting people to sign up for your email list, there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, there are you could you can do partnership work. Uh, that can be that can be a six that can be one of you really have to have like a multi-tiered sort of strategy around this, but there's a lot of different tools, tactics that you can use. Um, but let's say that you are, you have partners in New York, in your community. If you are able to promote each other's work in your, in your respective newsletters, that's a way to get some new subscribers. Um, digital ads is another, is another way to build your list. Um, periodically inviting folks to sign up for your newsletter um, through your social accounts is, an, is another way. Making sure there's an easy way to sign up for emails when people attend an event um, or receive a service. Those are some, those are some other areas. Uh, getting people to open emails, A-B testing, um, if you have the capacity to do it, is, is going to be really key to figuring out some of the things that will move people to open. But opening is, is valuable, but then what you want is for people to actually engage with their content. So having a compelling subject line, but one that actually demonstrates the value of the content to your audience is going to be really critical. And sometimes it's not even about the content itself. Like it, it is about the content, but it's really about, is the content reaching the right people? So this goes back to understanding your audience. So if you are emailing everyone in your list all the time, and you're not segmenting, you'll typically not, you're going to see open rates that aren't as robust as they could be. Segmenting is valuable because then you're speaking to people based on what their needs and interests are. And I know that segmentation can take some time, but it's really worth doing because it will help you over time lower your unsubscribe rate. It will help, um, help you to see those numbers climb around your open rate and your click rate. And providing value when it comes to the content, once you've figured out what it is that your audience wants, 
And I'll go back to that example about affordable housing. Let's say you've got a segment of folks who need affordable housing, and you've got a segment of folks who are advocating for affordable housing policies. The content that you might uh, that you would want to develop for, for emails for those two segments is not going to be the same. You might be able to draw from the same report, but the way that you take that content and the way that you craft it is going to look different because you're answering different questions. And that in turn is going to help increase your open rate because you're going to be providing content that is more valuable to those segments. All right, what else do you do folks have for me here? Something I am seeing from comments that folks submitted in advance was, I'm especially interested in how Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram strategy can work to increase fundraising by drawing in new people. Um, this is a great question, and I have spent a lot of years when I worked in nonprofit really focusing on social media strategy, and it has become increasingly challenging to work in social media and have it be successful um, because of how algorithms have changed and how much paid content is now privileged. So it's tricky it, it, um, to engage on a platform like TikTok where that is video-based is very time intensive um, and often really driven by influencer culture. And if you can't invest in those things, it might not be a viable strategy for, for your organization at all. So it really depends on understanding where your people are and where you have an opportunity to really dig in and grow. You may find that Instagram is a place where people are more engaged and maybe you have more resources that you can Leverage. I've found that Instagram is still a place where you can get more organic engagement without having to drop um, advertising dollars in the same way. But the thing with it, social media is that you have to engage with people a lot. Um, it's not a platform. None of those platforms are platforms where you can just drop a post once a week and call it good. Um, you need to have things like live Q and A's on topics that interest people. Um, you wanna cover what's happening in your organization in a way that provides a window into the authentic work that you're doing. Um, there, there's just a lot of really thoughtful strategy that has to go into a successful social, um, social campaign to ultimately get people to be, to convert to donors because don't, Getting folks to become donors is a is a multi step process, right? Because first, if you're if you're trying to reach to completely new people, you have to reach those people. Then you have to get them to be engaged with you. They need to trust you. They need to think that your organization is worth their money, their time, and their attention. That takes months to years sometimes to move people to, you know, to that level and then to the level of like, okay, this organization is an organization that I want to monetarily invest in. So you have to understand that you're playing a long game when it comes to getting new people from really from anywhere. Um, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And that's, that's fine, right? Like you need to have that longer term strategy for acquiring new donors, but you want to be realistic about how long it's going to take to take someone from, I just heard about your organization to now I'm going to give you money. That's not, that's not fast. Typically that takes, that takes time and effort and energy and, and dollars. And so that's why having a multi-tiered um, strategy around fundraising is so important where you're engaging with people who you already have on your list or on social or, or are already attending your events so that you have um, people who are further down that pipeline. And you also wanna have a constant stream of new people coming in so that you are 
not just having a donor pool that's that's so that you know that's limited that eventually ages out or you know you don't have anybody to draw from anymore. Uh, let's see how you balance being sounding fun, engaging, and human while not losing a professional tone, especially in the organization's work is more serious. Eviction, homelessness prevention. Is it worth bringing levity? to the post? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know that levity is really what you would bring to be authentic. I think if your work is really serious, um, it deserves a serious tone. Uh, and there's ways to make serious topics really engaging, um, without, without exploiting the people that you're, that you're working with, that you, that you're providing a service to. There's, there's ways of calling out the injustice that people are facing um, through not just personal stories, but maybe through related news stories of, of an issue that is happening in your community that relates to the type of work that you're doing. Maybe with eviction, it might look like examining and doing a Q&A um, like in partnership with an affordable housing coalition to talk about rising rents in your city and how that is having a negative impact on lower and middle income people and the in the sort of the ripple effects that that has. You might be able to then leverage that into a news, you know, a news story. So thinking about, I think it's really about figuring out the tone that's appropriate for the work that you're doing, and then thinking about what what stories what narrative is truthful and compelling and what is going to be relevant to your audience. Because if, if folks are following you because they care about um, eviction or homelessness prevention, they're not looking to get a, a, a laugh when they're looking at your posts. They're looking for probably to be more educated on the topic or to know what's happening in their community. And sometimes that information can be hard to find. And so providing some of that information to them can be really valuable and that can drive increased engagement. And then you can use that um, in other ways as you're moving your organization goals forward. So it might, it might look like if you work with folks who are unhoused in say like a homeless encampment, you might have some people who want to talk to your audience about their own experience of being homeless. There's ways to do that that are respectful, that aren't exploitative. That might be some, you know, something to explore. So I think really thinking about what makes sense for your organization and what is true to the work that you're doing um, while still appealing to the audience that you have is, is really critical. There was a question I think a lot of um, a lot of uh, organizations have is and said, as a nonprofit or we have a small team and the budget's small. What are some things that you think we can do in house to improve our digital presence, and what would require hiring outside help? Yeah, that's a great question and a perennial problem that um, our clients at Firefly often often face. We work with some. Um, you know, smaller to mid-tier clients in addition to larger clients. And those, you know, some of our, uh, some of our clients have more limited budgets. So they're really trying to figure out strategies that allow them to grow digitally without uh, that, that while still staying within budget. Um, I think that when it comes to where you want to really spend money, if you have money is on understanding your audience. Um, that's where our professionals can really help help you. There's actual methodologies behind audience analysis and persona development that do require a level of expertise that I think is really beneficial for an organization. But again, it's only beneficial if you know you're going to be able to use it. So I think it's for me, it always goes back to figure out what you can actually use. Um, and then also, how can you leverage folks from their, from their seat? So if you've got an organization with where you don't have a digital team, 
Um, and you just have, and you only have people who are focused on, on programming. I mean, the vast majority of organizations that I worked for when I was a nonprofit, I might've been the communications director, but I was the director of me and, <laughs> and nobody else. So if I wanted help, I had to figure out how to get the rest of the staff who were tasked with a million other things to actually help me, um, create create content. And, and really, I think content generation is where other folks in an organization can be really helpful. And I think it goes, then that goes back to how do you tie that into the job that they're already doing? And I'm going to go back to my example of the youth voter organization that I work for. And in some ways, yes, that's a little bit cheating because it's like we're working with youth and youth are on, you know, they're already on the internet, they're on social media, uh, which did make that easier. But one of the things that I did was I worked with our organizers, I train them on how to use social media, our social media accounts in a professional way and to drive forward their own organizing work and the goals that their organizing director had for them. And what they ended up doing was taking over our Instagram account. Each of our organizers had like an assigned day of the week and they ran the Instagram account for that day. And they worked with me on like the plan for how they were going to do it. But once they figured out their plan, then I trusted that they were going to be able to run with it and be professionals and not do something that would harm the organization. And it really worked. It really was a powerful tool for them. Um, and everybody had their own take on it. We had one person who would screenshot um, relevant local news every day and built like a huge story of like, this is what's happening locally in our community. And those, those stories got tons of views and a lot of engagement because a lot of, um, of our audience didn't necessarily have ready access to local news in another way. Um, another, another, um, organizer did, uh, would live stream their engage, their engagement on campus. So they would table at, on campus with educational materials and things like that. And they would see who was open to be asked questions about their level of like, say civic involvement or, you know, why they were voting or why they cared about voting or like whatever the question was. And then, so then they would turn the you know camera on them. And that was also, you know, really engaging. So it's really about figuring out what works for your organization and what works for the people within that organization. Uh, let's see. Do you like gathering additional extraneous data from youth? What OS does your smartphone use? Do you have check-in in services for hours? You can look at your nonprofit entity as a significant way to stay in touch. I'm not, uh, I mean, can you tell me, uh, I'm not quite sure I'm following you. Are you asking me to elaborate on my own example from my past work? or saying that that's a good strategy. I will say when I was, uh, when I was doing that work, I was not um, asking for extraneous data of that kind, like what, what was the OS? We were not that green, no, I mean, we didn't have the, even if I got that information, there was nothing I was gonna be able to do, to do with that information. <laughs> so I didn't bother to collect any of it. Um, love the idea of like the check-in, uh, check-in services for at-risk youth, depending on your organization, that could be a, you know, a valuable tactic for sure. All right. I know we only have a few minutes left. Does anyone have any final questions before we wrap up? I, uh, there was a question from, uh, that someone had chatted earlier and that was how would you drive participation on surveys? Mm. Oh boy, that is so challenging. Um, I don't, I don't have like a good one size fits all answer. I would say one way to drive participation on surveys is to keep them short. I will tell you that as somebody who does like to take surveys, if I have to like if I see that like that survey is a five page survey, I am not finishing that survey. <laughs> if it's a one page survey, 
where I can see all the, like, you know, that there's like five questions and like only a couple of them are a text-based answer. I'm much more likely to complete it. So I think keeping surveys short and thinking really carefully about what questions that you need to ask and the way that you want to ask those questions. If not every, every survey is going to have valuable data, be able to be gathered from like check boxes, but when you can, I think check boxes are, are great. And then only have a couple questions where you have a text-based answer. So I think people are a lot more likely to, um, to complete those. You can also, of course, offer little prizes and things like that. But I think the structure of a survey is going to, it has a much bigger impact actually on whether it's completed or not. How do you navigate a successful call for volunteers and speakers? Um, could you elaborate on what you mean by that? Megan? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. We have people within my research community speak. Okay, so are you um, are you looking to? get them to speak? Is that, is that like really the challenge that you're facing is, is getting them to commit to actually volunteer at a speaking engagement? And you feel free to unmute um, Megan. Yes. To drive their communicate, to drive their participation. Okay. Um, I guess it really depends on understanding what the constraints are. You know, why might some of these folks be reluctant? Is it a time, you know, is it a time issue? Is, do they not understand the, you know, is there not a clear value being presented to them for drive, for driving participation? It's partly time. Then I would suggest um, making the commitment to be like shorter, um, like say like a 20 minute talk, or a 30 minute talk versus saying like, you need to commit to an hour, maybe you put together a panel. Those tend to be a little bit lower, you know, lower commitment, or you have like an hour long session, but there's three people on the set, you know, in the session who are doing, you know, different, you know, different pieces of it. That would be, that would be one tactic. Can YouTube be used to sign up people? I have seen, all right, I think we might be out of, yeah, I think we're out of time. We will, uh, we're just coming up on the hour. I uh, wanna thank Elsa Roberts. Uh, speaking of survey, I want to, I just uh, submitted our feedback survey on the chat. You'll also find that on the email follow-up that's going up. Um, it's a very short survey, so I do appreciate if you fill that out. And a reminder that today's program is important to all of us um, and that a lot of organizations, including yourselves, have benefited from our Zoominars. So giving, uh, having said that, appreciate a donation of 10 or $20, it helps not only your organization, but the entire community of small to medium nonprofits in the greater Boston area. And finally, I just want to say thank you again to Elsa. And I also want to in, encourage you to sign up for our next Zoominar. Um, which will be on March 14th. And the Zoominar will be on fundraising. Um, just a moment. I apologize for that. And it will be on fundraising um, by a previous nonprofit net speaker who is terrific, Megan Amudson. I will uh, we'll be sure to send that, that information out in the coming weeks. So I encourage you to sign up for that and please check our website regularly 
for information on future Zoominars. Thank you again, Elsa. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. This was, um, this this was, was fun. Great. Thank you.